I'm Betsy Reese, and I'm in the marketing department at Children's Hospital and Medical Center. Uh, welcome to Parenting You, and we're mastering potty training tonight. Um, I hope you all had a chance to get a snack, and if you need to use the restroom, it's right out the doors to your left. Um, our speaker tonight is a pediatrician at uh, Methodist Physicians Clinic and serves on children's medical staff. With nine children of his own, he knows both the joys and the concerns of parenting, one of which is mastering potty training. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Bernie Douglas. Well, thank you. This definitely is a very popular topic. Um, if you Google um, potty training, you'll find 1.5 million entries. So obviously there's a high interest in it. Um, and really, you know, um, probably my wife is the expert. She's actually been on the front lines with nine of our children. And I can uh, happily say uh, that all of them are successfully potty trained. But um, how many are first time potty training parents here tonight? How many have, have already walked through this experience before? Are there any grandparents here tonight? Good. All right. Well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go from being wet. We're going to talk about the process to being dry. So, and uh, we're going to look at several things. We're going to look at, you know, common mistakes, uh, a, a, a common process that we look at, the things that we need to do, common mistakes that uh, parents make. First of all, it's important to understand uh, normal bladder and bowel control. We all hear stories of a 12-year-old or 13-year-old or 13-month-old who's uh, potty and bowel trained, but the average age is 30 months. There's a lot of differences between individuals and cultures in the United States. On the average, 27 months, that's overall. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics says by age 3, 40% of children are potty trained. The range of age is 18 months up to 3 to 4 years of age. Uh, normal progression is daytime bladder control, typically precedes bladder or bowel control, and then dry nights follow well after both. So it usually takes on the average 6 to 12 months after daytime control to establish nighttime control. And girls precede boys. Why that is, it's hard to say. Um, uh, many, maybe some of you have some opinions here after watching uh, our four boys and five girls, I would probably just say that, um, you know, boys don't care so when they're dirty. So, <laughs> Bedwetting is normal up to age four in girls and up to age five in boys. Uh, early training, less than two years of age. Now, you saw the range, 18 months, but less than two years is discouraged because of, you know, associated chronic problems later on. And that's what we want to try to prevent. You know, stool holding, retention, chronic constipation, eventually incapricis. And um, by making sometimes mistakes, those things can happen. A key factor in success is the readiness of the child. So, um, you know, I'm, you're going to hear me stress that over and over again. So we're going to have to look at, you know, different patterns of, for children, uh, their physical readiness, their behavioral readiness, and their emotional readiness. And, and what we have to differentiate here is uh, the child's interest rather than the parent's interest. Um, and so uh, when the child is ready, that's the best time to start. So the, to assess readiness, questions to ask. Does your child communicate to you before the passage of urine or stool? Or come and tell you afterwards, daddy I'm, or mommy I'm wet or I'm, um, I, I need my diaper changed. Those are, those are signs that they're getting close to the point of being ready. Can she or he hold for a minute or two before urinating or defecating? That's showing the physical capacity to have some control. And now, you're going to, many children, there's a huge differential. How many, how many have more than one or two children here? So you know that every child is different. Some kids are easy, some kids are, are not easy. And many children ma master toileting with ease, um, uh, particularly once they're able to verbalize their bodily needs. When they're ready, they're ready. And you'll hear stories, you know, when they were ready, three days, we were done. Uh, for others, toilet training can involve a protracted power struggle, and that's one thing you have to keep in mind is that we're also at age two or three, the child is trying to in, uh, assert their independence from their parents, um, and so that's, it, can, it can quickly 
develop into a power struggle, and that's what we want to prevent. Refusal to defecate in the toilet or polity is relatively common, leading to constipation or stool holding and parental frustration. You know, it's pretty intimidating, that big toilet with the loud noise and, and everything disappears and who knows where it goes. Um, so um, keep that in mind. How a two or three year old thinks is different than how you and I think. The process of toilet training involves positive reinforcement by the parents who recognize, first of all, their child's readiness and their developmental stage. And then we'll talk about that as we go along. Everything is in the handout here. And uh, we'll, we'll go through all these things. We'll look at it. And then at the end, uh, we'll leave some time for questions that you might have. So if you're thinking of anything, um, you know, questions that you have, problems that you're having or, or um, uh, walking through now as you're going through the process, we'll have time at the end to try to answer those. Minor hurdles in the toilet training process, such as the fear of the toilet or accidents when not wearing diapers, should be met with calm, understanding approach. And that's really important. How we respond as parents will oftentimes set the, the tone for the entire training process. And so the, the thing we have to ask ourselves, so as we're asking, is the child ready? We have to ask ourselves, are we ready? In other words, do we have the time? Do we have the patience? Those kinds of things to begin the process. So now we're going to look at some common things in this uh, process of, of training. We're going to go down this path. First of all, we're going to look at essential elements that need to be present for bladder control. The awareness of bladder filling. The child feels like their bladder is full. The brain's ability to override the reflex, uh, uh, unstable bladder contractions. The ability con to consciously tighten the ex external sphincter to prevent uh, wetting. Uh, normal bladder uh, growth uh, up to age 14 plus 2, that's the bladder capacity. So if you have a 3-year-old, uh, there would be 3 plus 2, 5 ounces would be the normal bladder capacity. So, you know, if, if they drink 14 ounces before they go to bed at night, then the chances of staying dry by morning are pretty, pretty, pretty hard. So keep that in mind. Um, motivation by the child to stay dry. That's really important, and it, and it varies from child to child, you know. Um, and that's, you have to rely on how you know your child, their natural tendencies, their natural motivation. And, and as you do that, you'll, it'll uh, help with success. Physical readiness, things that we have to look for neurologically, physically to, to be able to do, can they walk and run steadily? That's showing some neurologic development that needs to be there. Can they urinate a fair amount at one time? Uh, they have regular, well-formed bowel movements at relatively predictable times. All of us have the, what's called a gastrocolic reflex. In other words, 20 minutes after we eat a meal, we have a tendency to have a bowel movement. And that, when that starts to develop, and we take advantage of that when we're toilet training, then you, you can see that physically they're getting ready. They have dry periods, at least three or four hours. That's showing that they have you know, the bladder capacity. Uh, which shows that the bladder muscles are developing enough to hold urine. Behavioral signs that we look for. Can they sit down quietly in one position? Can they pull their pants up and down? Uh, do they dislike the feeling of wearing a wet or dirty diaper? And I, I think that's the difference between boys and girls. Boys don't care. They dislike the, um, they show interest in others' bathroom habits. In other words, they're watching daddy, they're watching mommy, big brother, big sister. Um, they give physical or verbal signs that they're having a BM, such as grunting, squatting, or they even come and tell you that they're going to have a bowel movement. They demonstrate a desire for independence. In other words, they want to be you know, their own person. They don't want someone necessarily changing their diaper or, or doing things for them. They take pride in their accomplishments. So they're excited when they've accomplished something. They're not resistant to learning to use the toilet. And that's going to be key. And we'll talk about that. How do we get them to that point where they're not afraid of the toilet? Is, is, in, general, is in a generally cooperative stage, not a negative or co contrary one. If they're, already, if they're kind of in a defiant stage, that's probably not the time you want to start toilet training. Can follow simple instructions such as go get the toy. Uh, understands the value of putting things where they belong. The, the stool goes and urine go in the toilet. Has a word for stool and urine. Yeah, poo, poo poo, uh, potty, caca, uh, you, you've defined those terms. Understands the physical signals. It's, it's about ready to happen. So now we're going to look at some, some common things that we do and common mistakes that can happen to get to this process of being dry. Common mistakes. And we'll talk about each of these in detail. 
So beginning the training at the wrong time, not making the right preparation, not establishing the right environment for potty training success, or trying to force or coerce the child to learn to use the toilet. So let's talk about training at the wrong time. Too early, the child isn't physically ready or emotionally ready. The wrong times, uh, and you have to think as a two or three year old to understand this. You know, stressful times, all of these that are listed, a new baby, just before vacation or during vacation, getting ready to start daycare. You know, a lot of times daycare is required that children be toilet trained before they come. Some daycares do that. So then you've got a timetable. You're putting the child under pressure um, during a, di a divorce or a marriage. Moving to a new house, that's a huge stressful event. Uh, summer versus winter. Um, in the winter, there's more clothes. It's a little bit harder physically to get the pants down and, and go through the layers to do the toilet training, whereas in the summertime, it's much easier, less clothing. Plus, it's, it's vacation time, typically, or it's time you know when you have more time to devote for it. Wait until the normal flow and activity resumes. Routines help establish security for your child and helps him or her place toileting easily alongside other structures and routines. So when things are running smoothly, that's when you want to try, or when you're back to your normal flow and activity, and you know, you might be sitting here thinking, well, well does that ever happen? But um, you, you, uh, you know, not during times when you're rushed or busy, um, uh, like we've already mentioned here. Remember too, that a diaper equals security for a child many times. So you're trying to establish security so that they abandon one security for another security. Use the right clothing, uh, establishing the right preparation, things like using the right clothing, um, dresses, skirts, pants with elastic waistbands like sweatpants, pajama bottoms, shorts, those are all much easier to use than, for example, overall suspenders, snaps, buttons. I, sometimes I even struggle with trying to get snaps off of uh, clothes in, in the clinic. Zippers, other fasteners, the onesie, that's... Uh, it can become very difficult. Again, snaps are involved. It's, it's uh, a little more cumbersome. Um, prepare by example. And, you know, kids learn by example for the better or for the worse sometimes. Uh, they they were, have been designed to imitate what they see. Um, so oftentimes um, girls go in with mom, uh, little boys go in with dad, and then by watching they, they learn. Prepare by teaching. Dumping the stool in the toilet and flushing. The proper place for all things, all things in their proper place. So um, you can practice dry runs, uh, sitting on the toilet fully clothed, and then eventually, you know, uh, taking, uh, doing this, the scheduled times of sitting on the toilet, like uh, preparing for potty training. Uh, establishing the right environment. Again, it's intimidating, a huge toilet that makes loud noises and things disappear. So it's, sometimes it's easier, and usually easier to start with a potty chair. The proper height, size, design, there's, you know, all kinds of things, whatever motivates the child, everything from Mickey Mouse to Batman, toilet chairs you can, you can find. Uh, a toilet with an accessible step and a stable lid. This is especially important for little boys because that lid can come down and hit a little, a little uh, uh, appendage, and that can be very sore and very negative. So what we're always trying to do is promote a positive experience and try to stay away from the negative experience. Don't discount the child's fear. You know, the slippery toilet seat, you know, feeling like they're going to fl get flushed down the toilet, the loud flushing toilet, little bottoms touching the water, um, wet, slippery bathroom floors, um, uh, a snake in the toilet, you know, that um, all kinds of fears it can set them back to square one and require, you know, a little vacation, a little hiatus from that. Don't discount attachments. Their poop is their poop. It's a part of them. So flushing it can be a loss. And, you know, I, the story a mom told me just recently that, and it really impressed me, you know, you don't always think, again, think like a two or three year old. Um, so a part of them is, is, is disappearing and gone forever. So this mom said that uh, her uh, three year old, would, when she flushed the toilet, she'd wave goodbye and say, I love you as it flushed down the toilet. So <laughs> I thought that was cute. Also remember, diapers equal security. So you're, you're abandoning one security and trying to establish another. Don't set deadlines. Most children don't do well under pressure. Most of us as adults don't do well under pressure, children even less. And don't give in to external pressures, um, grandparents especially. That can oftentimes in-laws many times. Um, remember, that's a different culture they came from than what we are establishing today. 
Um, you know, we look at more child center, child's interest, where in, in their culture, it was a sign that they were maybe negative parents if their child wasn't potty trained by a, by a certain age. Um, and um, for pressure from friends, you know, uh, don't get caught up in competition. It doesn't end with toilet training. I mean, it's pretty soon it's, you know, sports, and then uh, what college they go to, it never ends. What job they have. Um, so don't get caught up in that. And you can start with toilet training. Um, daycare preschool administrators, many times they require kids to be toilet trained. So kind of keep that in mind. Don't try to fall under the, find a daycare where they don't have to be toilet trained. Um, and unless they're ready to be toilet trained. And don't need to bribe, but work with the child's natural motivations. And let me explain to you the difference between a bribe and a reward. A bribe is what you do before the behavior. You say, oh, well, you know, if you do this, then we're going to we're gonna go to this uh, Baby's R Us or we'll go to Toys R Us and we're going to buy this nice toy for you. Whereas a reward is what comes after they already accomplish the behavior. And it's kind of more of a surprise. Now, to say that and yet to say also, you can establish rules, basically. For things like stickers, if you are able to go on the toilet, you know, we'll have a sticker for you. So there's an understanding. That's a little bit different than a bribe. Um, or that you can send up a long-term reward. You know, once you're all established, once you're, um, you know, have, uh, toilet trained, then we'll go out and buy that, you know, whatever uh, toy might motivate them or something that might be fun for them. Of course, there's the Internet story that talks about the parents who said, you know, once you're toilet trained, we're going to go to Disneyland. And so the next morning, the child showed up, suitcase packed, and no diapers. So, but that, that's, not, not, that's not a true story. So. And don't worry, be happy. Be positive about it. Have fun while you're doing it. You know, use a little humor. Um, uh, life is short. Um, take the time. That's uh, many times what happens when you're under pressure yourself, then it's, it's hard to make it a fun thing or um, and a, 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 and a positive time. Encourage them. That's a big thing. Uh, rewards uh, for praise, especially all kids respond to praise. Let's look at some differences between boys and girls. Boys take longer. Uh, boys need to stand. Girls need to wipe, and they wipe from the front to the back. That's part of the process, uh, and it's easier to come from the back to the front, of course. And then that's why we also say that girls are, could have the possibility of a bladder infection, a one-time uh, bladder infection just based on hygiene, just based on anatomy. Uh, more than two times, or two times or more, usually there might be another problem. Boys should never get a bladder infection. That's usually a sign that there might be something else going on. Uh, and then with boys sitting to standing, it's a two-step process. You start with sitting, establish that, and once that's happened, then go to standing. Um, um, my, I remember my brother-in-law, uh, he was trained by kneeling in front of the toilet. And even as an adult, he still did that. I thought that was always interesting. <laughs> Don't treat accidents like a big deal. They're part of the process. Accidents happen, and that's just expected. You know, it's going to happen, and when it does happen, encourage them. Try to be positive. Try not to um, uh, belittle the child um, uh, or try to make them feel bad because they, they had an accident, uh, but try to encourage them. It's just a part of life and the process of potty training. Overemphasizing accidents can actually reinforce uh, the problem and lead to more accidents. Generally, the problem, just think of it this way. Generally, the problem is not with the child uh, or the trainer, but with the understanding of the problem. In other words, they're, maybe they're not physically ready. Maybe that, you know, the developmental milestones, they're not quite there yet. Uh, or the preparation. Maybe it, we're going about it the wrong way or we haven't kind of prepared them in a certain way so they uh, get over their fears or the method that we're using is wrong. Um, now, as you look on the Internet, you're going to see, I, I thought it was interesting um, it, there was everything you could imagine, everything from toilet training in three easy steps, toilet training in 24 hours, toilet training over the weekend. I mean, it was just toilet training in seven days. And usually there was a price involved you could send for the program. And, and um, there were, I didn't see too many money back guarantees, however. Um, but um, uh, you'll, you'll find all kinds of different approaches. 
But these are just basic principles that fit all, that you need to understand uh, whatever uh, method or approach you take. Diffusing issues by temporary cessation of training. In other words, take a diaper holiday and stop the training. You know, it's not going so well. Well, life is short. It's no big deal. We'll start again another time. When the child is motivated, when the child is ready, then um, uh, that, that kind of reinforces to them that, you know, this is, this is still a positive thing. And uh, that, you know, eventually they will have mastery over the toilet. I've been to a lot of uh, high school and college graduations. I haven't seen anyone there, th there yet that was still wearing diapers. So, so you can uh, rest assured in that. It, it, it will happen in time. I like to use this, the ABCs of potty training. So first of all, assess your child's readiness and your own. Are you ready? Are you, are you willing to invest the time, the money, and, and you know, getting the proper equipment, things that you need? Um, and the patience uh, in, in order to do this. Buy the right equipment. Um, and, you know, garage sales are great. You know, it doesn't have to be a lot of money. You can easily pick up these things uh, at garage sales. Well, many times it's almost new. Create a routine. Kids get security in routines. What we usually recommend is take advantage of the gastrocolic reflex. In other words, have them sit on the toilet for every year of age for one minute for every year of age, uh, 20 minutes after they eat a meal. So after breakfast, so yeah, have your three-year-old sit on the toilet, uh, the, the uh, training seat or a potty chair for uh, three minutes. If they're successful, praise them, make a big deal. Um, but if they're not, no big deal. You can set a little egg timer and when the, when the three minutes is up, they can get up and go play. And, take, and then have that routine three, three times a day and right before bedtime. And as you're, as you're ready to start, that's a good thing to do. We're establishing that routine. And they realize this is, this is, they are taking advantage of the opportunity and giving them that opportunity. And then um, uh, the possibility of success is much higher. Demonstrate for your child. Again, watching by example. And some people say that's why little girls do better than little boys, because they're watching mom. And, um, uh, but, you know, all of a sudden something clicks one day where they realize, you know, Big Bird doesn't wear diapers or or their favorite football player doesn't wear diapers, and so they are highly motivated and want to do it too. Foster the habit, again, establishing that routine, you know, after meals especially or right before bedtime. Uh, grab some painting, training pants. In other words, give them a chance to go without diapers during the day. The training pants, catch them before they're having an accident. Um, gr uh, handle setbacks gracefully. And, that, you know, that's hard. It's hard especially because, you know, Unfortunately, training pants don't always hold all the urine or stool, and uh, you can have messes, and, um, but, but handle it gracefully. And then introduce night training after you have the daytime training, and then jump for joy when you're done. Uh, potty training tricks. Uh, you, there's all kinds of tricks out there. You can take a, a tour of uh, Babies R Us um, and uh, find all kinds of interesting things there. Um, Potty training videos and books for parents to learn, uh, for kids to learn. Uh, by example, again, staying positive and calm through the process is important. Uh, you can use uh, potty training incentive charts, calendars. Um, I like to use stickers. I, I always say I couldn't ever run a pediatric practice if I didn't have stickers. And at home, the same thing. You know, you can get a calendar, a big calendar, and, and have the child put a sticker on for every day that they have a success, or maybe every day that they're dry, depending on the child. And, um, and that helps them to see, too, physically, that they're making progress. Helps you to see with that day-to-day -day routine. Sometimes you forget. You know, it used to be every day. Now it's just twice a week. And so you can look back and see your, your success. You can buy little targets for little boys to shoot at or little girls to shoot at that float in the toilet that flush easily. Uh, stepping stools are helpful. Again, you know, remember as you're graduating to the toilet, that's, that is a huge, um, uh, you know, a climb. A potty chair on top of the toilet seat is also an excellent transition. It makes them feel more secure, less like slipping, falling in that huge hole that flushes to who knows where. And so um, that's a helpful thing. Potty seat inserts, same thing. Pre-moistened wipes are helpful, and that, that just makes it easier to clean up afterwards easier for them to use. Um, and then, all, of course, hand washing teaching is all part of it. And then travel ideas. You can bring a folding uh, travel potty seat or travel chair um, and, and continue the process even while you're uh, having a vacation or on, while you're traveling or going to grandpa and grandma's. 
keep in mind, you know, a lot of times, and um, I hear, I heard this just this week from someone at my office as they were kind of consulting me uh, through potty training. Uh, their um, uh, about three and a half year old son uh, goes to daycare, is dry all day, is successful all day, goes in the toilet all day, but as soon as he gets home at five at night, he puts on his diapers and he's done. It's like he's, he's worked all day and, he's, and now he's home, he can relax. <laughs> and it's been kind of frustrating for the parents, but you know, again, you gotta realize that they're gonna see the parents differently. They're gonna see you differently as parents, as, as at the daycare, these are strangers, they're trying to please, kids that have a high desire to please. Grandparents, same thing. So then that, that feeds in many times to the cultural aspect where the grandparents say, well, you know, he's dry for me. Uh, I don't know what you guys are doing wrong, but, you know, when, we, when you were little, we, we didn't have any problems with you. So that can kind of feed into that. And, uh, but remember, you know, with you, it's going to always be different. You know, they always do better with strangers and with other family members than they will with their own parents. What works? Again, you're hearing me say over and over, wait until the child is ready. And when the child is ready, it goes, it goes really fairly easily. Um, uh, make a plan. Have a plan. You know, start by early um, in things like having them introduce them to the toilet. When you change their diaper, you can dump the, have them take the, the dirty diaper and dump it out in the toilet and let them flush it. You can do the dry runs on the toilet with fully clothed, even with the lid down. So they're sitting there realizing this is where... It goes talking to them, you know, long before they're physically ready. This is what we do. This is where it'll eventually go. All those things, kind of preparing them for them. Uh, praising, praising your child. Um, you know, praise is a huge thing. Um, kids always respond to praise. And vice versa, the negative uh, motive or negative praise or, in, you know, things like uh, belittling them, they also respond in a negative way. Motivating your child. You know, you can set up a reward system like we talked about. Um, one thing I would discourage is using food as a reward. Um, that kind of sets up some, maybe some bad habits later on in life. So we discourage that. However, I heard a story from a mom just recently who said that she gave an M&M after the first successful time. The child was so motivated after that that they wanted to sit on the toilet all day so they could get an M&M whenever they wanted one. So accept that there will be accidents. That's just part of the whole process. You can accept that and be patient. And most of all, have fun through everything. What doesn't work? Again, starting too soon. If you start too soon, that's you know, you know, giving in to pressures or um, not necessarily understanding the process or things that need to happen. That sets them up for um, failure. Starting at the wrong time during during those stressful times when it's probably not the best time to try to start something new. Putting on the pressure, uh, having them feel the pressure is almost always a negative thing. Or following your mother-in-law's timetable. I hear that very often in the office. You know, again, um, you know, there's that mother-in-law uh, dynamic that enters in sometimes. Being in a hurry, you know, take your time. Don't, again, choose the right time, not in a time where it's, you've got a deadline you've got to meet. You've got to, you know, we're going to start daycare in one month, so we've got to be potty trained by then. Uh, getting frustrated with the child. That's easy to do. And I stand here as a parent, and I, it, the potty training is just one thing that you can get frustrated, uh, but try to battle that and, and look at it more as an opportunity to teach, an opportun opportunity to help. And then punishing the child. You know, that's one thing that um, maybe that the other generation did that we try to discourage. Again, this is going to happen. It's eventually going to happen. And what, what we'll see many times, I see in the clinic, are kids who hold their stool because they, you know, they, for whatever reason, associated negative feelings with toilet training. And they're holding their stool, then they, it leads into problems even later on at age 12 or 13, where they're soiling their pants or their chronic constipation. So um, try to be positive. And I certainly, I would discourage punishing the child. Although, you know, there's some interesting um, things that you're going to hear. I came across a recent article even in the newspaper where um, the, the editor in the World Herald was praising a parent who had told him how they took their favorite blanket when they uh, stooled their pants and uh, threw it up in the closet and said, you're never going to see that again unless you're, you know, 
you uh, uh, do the, if you do this again, and then that supposedly the child never soiled their pants again. I would probably discourage that and try to be more positive in, in rewarding and praising them uh, when they are successful, realizing that you know they're eventually going to be trained. They're eventually this is going to happen. So, um, so I just want to open it up for questions right now. Are there any questions? Yes. My question is about nighttime training. Okay. When should you be introducing that, and is there anything different in how you do that as opposed to daytime? Yeah, nighttime, nighttime is after daytime. daytime. For, so first of all, that's important. And as you saw, there's an average of 6 to 12 months after they're trained during the day that they get that control at night. And it varies significantly from child to child. And what you're going to see are patterns that run in families. So if, if there's a pattern in the family where the father or mother might have been a bedwetter till age 12, that's probably going to be a tendency for, for at least 50% of the time for the children. Um, other things we look at are kids who have sleep problems, kids who are heavy sleepers, or kids that tend to drink a lot before they go to bed at night. And remember the, the um, uh, criteria we said that, you know, one ounce for every year of age plus two. So if a child is, we uh, talked about four and five being about the time when on the average kids start to be dry at night. And it's a bell curve. I mean, you're going to see some kids that go on even into adulthood with bedwetting, which is okay. Um, there's things that we can do to help with that, medications and, and uh, programs that are available. But um, the, for the most part, kids are trained by, you know, five, uh, six years of age on the average. Um, but things that we do is say no caffeine you know, uh, drinks during the day. Caffeine is a, a natural diuretic. So if they're drinking a lot of caffeine, they're going to urinate more. Also volume of fluids. So if, if they're going to bed at night drinking, you know, a can of pop or something, which is, you know, eight ounces and they're, you know, four years old, they're going to have a problem keeping that in through the through till morning. So you want to. What I usually say is limit their fluids to whatever their bladder capacity is going to be after supper. So if they're you know eat supper at six, go to bed at nine. So between five or uh, six and nine, they should probably not have more than uh, six ounces if they're four years old. And then always in the routine of emptying their bladder, even if they well I don't need to go to the bathroom, we'll have them go anyway and sit there for one minute for every year of age have the opportunity to do that. And if they are successful, then great. Um, and then um, waking up at night, uh, waking the child up, say, two or three hours after they're asleep, I haven't found that to be very successful over the years. T t generally, you're training the parent more than you're training the child. And usually they're wet anyway by the time you wake them up, if that's the case. So by limiting fluids, that's helpful. Limiting caffeine, emptying the bladder routinely during the day also strengthens those muscles. Um, through the day so that they are able to do it at night. And um, some kids are just deep sleepers, you know. Um, uh, they uh, tend to not feel that sensation they need to urinate because they their sleep cycle is so deep and then they lose bladder control. And so, th again, I would say don't punish them the next morning. Uh, but I do try to teach that um, it's good for them to accept responsibility. I mean, it, it, even though it happened, it wasn't their fault, but it, just like a lot of things in life, we still take responsibility for them. So depending on the child's age, um, I would say, you know, that every child probably can take the sheets off the bed. The older kids can actually take the sheets off, carry them over the hamper, and even the 12 or 13 year old maybe can run them through the washer and, and dryer and then fold them afterwards or put them back on the bed. What that does is it kind of enforces to them, you know, that there'll be actions and consequences for even being wet, even though it wasn't their fault. And there's a point in time where they, you know, they can sense, you know, I feel like I could probably get up and go to the bathroom. I'm, I think I'm sleeping. Maybe I'm not sleeping. And I'll, oh, well, you know, I'm wet anyway in the morning. But they realize if I go, if I don't wake up, then, you know, I'm just going to have to change the sheets in the morning. So it ends up being a, a, a you know, a reinforcer to them to, try to wake up and, and go to the bathroom eventually. But that, you know, the, those are down the road a little bit. So those are some, some things that, that we use to try for the nighttime training. Um, you can use the, um, um, the pull-ups as well, and that helps a little bit too. And then eventually uh, uh, training pants. And, um, and you can expect, even when they're in the process, to have maybe two wet nights a week. That's part of it. That means you're making progress. And then you can always look at then what happened during the day when they weren't successful that night? Maybe they drank a can of Pepsi or, you know, they had a really busy day and they slept really sound that night. 
And you can kind of see those patterns then, and that helps us as well. So. Yes. Uh, our son is oh, just turned four, and he um, he is potty trained, but he's not poopy trained. Okay. So, um, and he knows exactly where it goes, and he knows if you ask him where do you go poopy in the toilet. But he'll hold it all day, and he'll even go hide when mom and dad are busy and trying to do his business, and we'll pick him up, put him on the toilet, and he'll he just he won't go. He's I don't know if he's just terrified of. Going poop or we have that same problem too. Yeah, yeah, and that's usually what happens is that they, for whatever reason, again, you have to think like, how old is your child? He just turned four. Just turned four. You have to think like a four-year-old. You know, there uh, for something there was a the probably fear involved, uh, or negative feelings, or whatever that caused them to want to hold the stool. So those are that's a very common thing that happens. So when that happens, I would say uh, first of all. Um, realize that, that there's an issue here. There's probably fear involved and, and try to be understanding. Um, it, it is frustrating, you know, when they know they can go, they go high, you know, I can tell you stories over the years of kids who, um, uh, uh, you know, go in the corner, always the same corner or turn the light off in the bathroom and, and, and squat down next to the toilet and dirty their pants. But, you know, there's usually fear involved for whatever reason. So what, what I would say is, you know, encourage them and try to talk to them, try to find out what it is. You know, use the potty chair, especially because there, usually there's a lot of fear with the toilet. That's a very common thing, the loud noise, the flushing, things that disappear, where do they go? Remember, kids at age four don't think concretely. They're not thinking that, to that stool or that, uh, you know, poop I just had is going into a sewer system and flushing away somewhere. To, as far as they're concerned, it's going who knows where. And there's all kinds of fears that can be associated with that. So talking to them, help, you know, educating them, letting them know, you know, what, what's happening. It's okay. Um, and then taking, even though they're not successful, I would recommend, this is what I usually tell my parents, is have them sit on the toilet, you know, after each meal uh, for one minute of age, for four minutes, set a, get a little egg timer. Back there, you can, you can buy them with Mickey Mouse on the handle or something, and, and the child can set it, sit on the toilet 20 minutes after each meal. And then um, if he's not successful, no big deal. Eventually he will be. And try to find out what the fears might be. Um, and um, again, realizing, you know, daddy does this, mommy does this, big brother does this, you know, big bird uh, doesn't have any problem with this. All those kinds of things kind of help feed into that. And eventually they work through that. When, you, when you're negative about it or you frustrate the child about it, that's when it can lead to long-term problems. Things like what we call incapricis, which is a problem where they, you know, have chronic constipation and they actually soil their pants because they're holding their stool so much that they're the the uh, they lose that sensation of even feeling like they have to have a bowel movement, and so they they constantly leak. So that usually happens later on, but that's what we're trying to prevent. So the other thing I would say is take a, a, a holiday from it. You know, basically don't. Don't make a big deal about it, you know, just wait, look for the opportunity to praise, encourage, um, what, in any little way you can, you know, even if it's, um, uh, you know, catching them being good, you know, not doing it and, and um, saying, praising them for not doing it rather than, you know, getting upset for them, with them for doing it. Yes. Question about that. It, um, with my daughter, she says it hurts. It hurts. So it hurts, and it's because she holds it for two days at a time. Right. And so then she becomes constipated, and we try to stool soften her so that it, to show her it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. And I've tried everything under the sun, and, you know, and it's always, in my opinion, positive reinforcement. But um, I guess my question is at what point, I know it all takes time, and we can take a break and all that, but at what point, because she's three and a half, and at mm -hmm. what point do you start applying a little bit more pressure? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because I don't want her to be five, and I mean she's the only one in her preschool class that still mm -hmm. has this problem. Well, and her teachers support her. I mean, they're very right. great about working. So with she's having accidents, accidents in the preschool. She, um, yes. Okay. <laughs> she is, and, and that's hard because the other kids are yeah, not. And yeah, but when she goes to friends' houses, um, she follows what they do. So we don't have a problem when we go anywhere else. It's just at home. Right. Or she's had an accident or to a school, even though the other kids are going. But at what point do you start applying a little more pressure and not just thinking it's not a big deal anymore? 
Well, um, you know, one thing I would say, first of all, is that one thing I've noticed over the years, the smarter kids kind of, so if they have constipation, it hurts when they go to the bathroom, then they associate that with pain, and that's why they hold stool. So that's another negative thing that happens. So you want to prevent the constipation. So by keeping them soft, um, that helps them have the opportunity to have a, a normal, non-painful stool. So that's when you need to talk to your pediatrician or to your physician. Uh, things like lactulose, very safe, non-habit forming, Miralax in the older kids. It's a powder that you buy, um, and it, it's a matter of just giving enough of it. If you give enough, they'll they'll be loose and they'll be soft. So and and so that's the first thing you need to do is get, eliminate the painful stool. The second, and try to keep their bowel empty by you know using a stool softener. And you know again, the, um, you can use some of these. Um, not intimidating, not um, you know belittling, but you know um, positive reinforcements. Um, uh, uh, pressure, um, you know, you can set up the reward system. That's what I usually tell parents is that, you know, when you start to go um, potty in the, or poop in the potty, then we're going to, you know, you know what motivates them. Use their natural tendencies. Maybe it's, um, you know, going with mom or dad on, on trips or, or to the store or spending more time or um, maybe it's that, you know, for a little boy, a uh, new baseball glove, for a little girl, new doll. You know, something that doesn't cost, a, you have to take out a bank loan for, but something that, you know, maybe would highly motivate them to, um, to do that, uh, to be successful. That's what I would recommend to try to do. Um, you know, some of these things will work where you're negative, you know, where you're, like the story I, I just told you about, it was in the World Herald. But at the same time, you can have problems with that later on, you know. So, you know, just because it, it works on the short term doesn't mean it's always best for the long term, I guess. Yes. Um, now, we have twins. Would you say try and do them together or break them up? Well, I would say look individual. Look at the individual and rather than, you know, sometimes it's easy. You know, again, this is going to be a common thing that goes on through the, all their life. You know, they're going to be doing a lot of things together. So sometimes it's easier to do it together. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's better to look at them individually. So if they're both ready at the same time, I would say, yeah, go ahead and do it together. Um, if, they're, if one's ready and the other one's not, then a lot of times that becomes motivation for the other one as well. Work with the one that's ready. Again, looking at the guidelines that we gave physically, emotionally, behaviorally, um, to see if they're ready or not. Yes. When you're potty training and say you do have to go on like a car ride and your kid is a little older and they kind of understand, are you kind of messing with their mind if you tell them, well, let's put a diaper on, but you tell, but tell mommy if you have to go potty and we can pull over or keeping that diaper on, I'm kind of not working out. Well, again, you know, the diaper security. So they, most of the time, kids, that doesn't really throw them off. I mean, you know, they, that, that means, you know, boy, if I do have an accident, again, if they're motivated to be dry, they'll usually be dry, even with a diaper on. Just like the child I told you about who comes home from daycare. He's fine all day in daycare and, and you know, doing great, gets home, puts the, puts the diaper on himself, and then, you know, that's it for the, until he goes to daycare the next day. So every child is different. So I, I don't think that's going to really throw him off. You know, certainly is more convenient realizing traveling, you know, it's hard when you're driving down the road and you have an accident in the back seat. To, to, so that's, that certainly makes it easier. I don't think it, it you know, and every child's different. You're going to have exceptions, obviously. But for the most part, I think they find more security in that. They realize, you know, oh, oh I had an accident, but great, I had this on, so that's great. It worked out well. So, yes. Is there a rule of thumb for transitioning from pull-ups to underwear? Like should they be dry for a number of days first? Or I don't have any rules of thumb. I mean, again, every child is different. Some some kids do better in training pants, you know, um, big girl pants, big boy pants, and, and it's, a, again, an added motivation. For some kids, it doesn't make any difference. You know, it's like a big deal. If I have pants or I have, uh, you know, the uh, training diapers on, it doesn't matter. So you just have to use your judgment on that. Yes. Kind of along the lines of their question, we have twins also, boy, girl, and do they need, should they have their own separate chairs or can they share potty? I would say have their own separate chairs. Um, again, you know, that's just a kind of a general rule, separate cribs, separate chairs, it kind of promotes individuality, but at the same time, they're going to do a lot of things together. That brings up a good point. You have a twin boy and girl, so the girl is going to usually, on the average, be sooner than the boy, and just, just because that's just the way it is. 
Um, there's no really good explanation for that, but that's um, typically what you see. So realize that that might play a role too. The other question is, because the sister has to sit, we should start him sitting also, is what, the, what our pediatrician said. When you transition to him to standing then? Well, once he's successful sitting, then he's ready to stand. Of course, little boys are going to want to do what dad does. So they want to start standing, and, you know, again, that sets them up for failure because it's going to be much more difficult. But, you know, I would, I would say once they're successful sitting, then they can start standing and aiming. So, um, yes? Our son's more would rather go standing and sitting, and he doesn't do well sitting, but he's doing better the last two days standing. Um, but he also is just generally does not have an interest and until like today was the first day he really went all day but it just mm -hmm. don't really care can not care if he's wet or right so it's been hard to get motivated or doing anything yeah and that's common with boys so i i guess i my advice would be you know don't press it he'll be ready when he's ready and you know a lot of times they'll we misinterpret the cues i think as parents you know, they go to the bathroom one day, it's kind of like, hey, this is something new. I saw somebody do this. Let me see if I can do it. And so they do it for a day, and then it's like, oh, no big deal. I mean, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be, so I'll go back to what I used to do. And, and then we misinterpret that. Well, you can do it, so let's do it. And yet yeah, they're not ready. So I would, I would say that he's obviously close. Um, and, you know, again, you know, every child is different. You know, if, if he's going to do better, you know, and you don't have carpet around the toilet, then you could have him try to stand, you know. But, you know, it's going to, in general, it's harder to do that. So, but that, that might motivate more, more, too. Again, she got to have to balance those things. Yes? Two, and she tends to poop in the shower a lot. Mm -hmm. Why does she do that? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> if I could answer that, boy, I'd be, be in good shape. But, you know, I've, like I said, I've seen kids over the years where they pick out a corner in the house and they go in, turn the light off, squat down behind a one, – one child I remember squatted down behind a dresser. And that was the only place that she would have a bowel movement was behind the dresser. And, you know, I mean, why they do that, it's, I think it has to do with security and the sense of safety. And so, you know, she feels safe, obviously, in the shower, you know, doing that. So um, then I would try to, you know, help her to feel safe with the toilet. You know, again, go through the dry runs, go through. She goes, she goes in the toilet, but she seems to, like, go and poop in the shower instead. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, again, you know, that's part of them. Sometimes that plays a role, you know, they're afraid to lose part of them, you know, and they, that way they can see it and realize it's there and, you know, it eventually disappears, but somebody will, you know, get rid of it. But yeah, it's hard to say. It's hard to explain why that happens. But you see those patterns in, in, in kids every once in a while. And, and I would just say, you know, go back to the basics and just try to make the, remove the fear, whatever it might be, help them realize the proper things at the proper place, Showers are fine, but they weren't meant for, for this, and this is where we want to do this. And so, again, teaching and, and working through it and not getting frustrated, which is hard. And as a parent, sometimes um, I can speak to that. I saw another question. Yes? Yeah. Looking for some advice on removing the fear, I guess. Uh, our daughter, um, about a year ago, had a, a really painful constipation. And um, now she, uh, without Miralax, uh, she won't poop at all. She'll just withhold. And she doesn't want to go anywhere near the toilet with her pants off, though she'd be happy to sit on it with her pants on. And so for a year, that fear is, is still in there, and it's not lessening as any that we can see. And I'm wondering if you have any practical advice there about things that we could try to lessen the fear. Well, the biggest thing is, and the thing that I see in the clinic a lot is, you know, stay on the Miralax. I mean, sometimes it takes a year. The smarter kids remember longer, so, um, and that's a good, uh, remem or a good thing to remember later on in other things in life as well. But um, stay, keep the stool soft. Try to help her forget the bad experience. So the longer she gets out from that and realizes that constant reinforcement, you know, I had a bowel movement today, it didn't hurt. So I guess maybe it isn't, doesn't always have to hurt like it did before. And eventually then that'll happen. And then following through the steps, you know, giving her the opportunity. I, I wouldn't push it. If she's afraid, I wouldn't force her or coerce her to sit on the toilet. Again, use the, the potty chair, 
of something that she's comfortable with. You know, sometimes it can be, you know, something that looks like a, a toy or their favorite, a cartoon character, or Minnie Mouse, or something that, you know, again, looks safe, basically. And then eventually work up to the toilet again. But just take your time and realize that, you know, she's afraid and, and uh, understand that. Yes. Um, you've kind of already touched on it a little bit. My daughter is, she just turned three, and she kind of has the same going poop problem in the pants as the other parents. But her problem is she has soft stool, but she'll go four or five times in one day. Mm -hmm. And she knows, she knows better. <coughs> so I'm just wondering, is there maybe something that she should see the doctor about? I mean, how old is your daughter? She just turned three. Just turned three. Okay, so again, you know. That's the average age to start to be successful. So I would say give her the opportunity to have a bowel movement. You know, if she's going three or four times a day, then have her sit on the toilet 20 minutes after each meal and right before bedtime. Try to take the opportunity to empty her bowel, basically, and take advantage of the gastrocolic reflex. So, you know, if she's three, so three minutes on the toilet. No longer set the timer. Uh, because if she sits longer than that, she's going to, you know, lose interest. It'll become a negative thing. And if, if it just be, the earlier you start things, um, the, the more routine they tend to be. And if, you know, if you start it later, um, like sitting on the toilet um, 20 minutes after a meal, then it's kind of like, what am I doing this for again? Um, so, and, or use the potty seat um, if they're afraid of the toilet. Yes. Um, my son's young. He's only 19 months. But it seems like whenever he has his diaper off, whether he's just got out of the tub or he just has naked time, he poops and pees. Is that an indication that he's ready or should he be <coughs> ready to? How old is he again? 19 months. 19 months. Well, you know, every child is different. You saw the range 18 months uh, on up to four or five. So there are, there are kids who are ready at 18 months. Again, I would say if he's ready, if he's physically ready, emotionally ready, behaviorally ready, then I'd go ahead and do that. If he's not, then I'd wait. You know, I wouldn't push it. And really, he'll tell you if, you know, if you're, again, that's unusual, but I have seen that, you know. So you can, again, follow the principles and see if, see if that works. Yes. My daughter started trying to go potty on the toilet by standing up and holding herself. Okay. Um, we finally broke that, but from the daycare, you know, seeing all the little boys, right. she would stand there and until we let her pee down her leg a couple times, she got back in bed. You got to sit down. She realized there was a better way, right? <laughs> yeah. Again, that just reinforces that they learn by watching. Yeah. Yes. You had mentioned earlier having them help when they're old enough wash the sheets or carry the sheets. <coughs> Do you see it as punishment if... Like when she um, has stools in her panties, mm -hmm. because I have I put them right away in the sink. We dump it in the toilet, mm -hmm. and I sit her on the toilet, and then you know I wash out her panties. Would you see it as punishment if I asked her to help me do that? Well, how old is she again? She's three and a half, three three years four months. Well, I mean she'd be able to take the dirty pants and carry them over the toilet and dump in the toilet. You know that's. That's not necessarily a, a really fun task usually, so she could do that. But as far as cleaning up a mess or something, for a three and a half year old, that might be asking too much. But dumping in the toilet easily is, is they're capable of doing, and that's a, more of a negative reinforcement, so to speak. Yes. Um, when you're first starting out, is it better to, um, you know, kind of keep them on a schedule of taking them to the bathroom every 30 minutes, or do you just wait until? <coughs> They're really able to tell you, I'm going to need to go potty, you know, I need to pee or I need to poop. You know, I understand about the whole bowel movement thing. We've talked about mm -hmm. that a lot. But I'm wondering more just about urination. Yeah, usually they'll, they'll tell you. They'll say, you know, I need to go to the potty. And, or, or they're dancing around in the corner or something, you know. Then you know it's probably a good thing to go ahead and, and help them, encourage them and, or help them, lead them to that. So. Well, um, we're at 7 o'clock, so we're, we're out of time. Um, but I'm going to stay around afterwards for as long as anyone has any questions. But feel free to leave uh, if you're on a schedule, of course. And so I'll just hang around here as well to try to answer any questions that you have. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, and good luck with potty training.